I mean, when when a when a, a former uh, manager comes out or 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 the organization, the team you used to play for comes out and says you're not mature. I mean, Kenny yeah. Cooper's what freaking thirty years old. Yeah, he's thirty. I mean, Twenty. How can 20, he be 20, immature yeah. at this point? Yeah, you can't be immature. I think what it is is it's a bunch of bullshit or that uh, that Wilkinson has come out and said just to sort of offload him and and give a good reason to get rid of him. You know what I mean? It's like he's an immature, he's horrible, and he's got a peg leg and he drinks too much and, <laughs> and he, you know, whatever, whatever. And he gets haircuts at seven bucks, you know, whatever. You know, I mean, it doesn't. I think it's just one of those things that just get rid of the guy uh, and just make up a couple of excuses. Um, do you it think really, I mean, the Timbers getting rid of this guy is? I think is a bit is a bit weak. Do you, you know? do you think that um, the fact that Kenny Cooper had such a famous father um, in some ways made it more def- difficult for him to succeed because it seems like he's gotten all the chances in the world, you know, and it just has. I mean, you, you start out at Manchester United, um, he, you know, then he went to FC Dallas, then he went over to Germany, and that didn't work out, and then he went over to England. I mean, you know. Did that hurt him or help him? I, I can't figure it out. Or he just didn't the, have the skill in the first place. I think it's the Manchester United thing. I think it's the fact that if you even have some inkling of a of a connection with Manchester United, everyone in America gets a, just a gigantic Woodrow. <laughs> just absolutely like, oh, my God, he's from Manchester United. You know? <laughs> so it's like, all right. Um, and that sort of, I mean, I think he sort of ro- rode that wave. Yeah. You know, and. At one point, people were loving him. At one point, he was the the main guy for you know the U.S. national team. You know, can it yeah. can a, can an aging? He's like twenty seven, twenty eight. Can this guy turn it around and at his next club? And that's again, that's probably a, a sub story of of next league of next uh, season's uh, you know uh, next season really. Yeah. Well, I've never seen such a big guy play like such a small guy. In my career, in in watching uh, a soccer, I mean, this is a guy who could have had the body to, you know, certainly become some transform into something bigger and better. And he just never learned how to hold the ball. He never learned how to head the ball, um, yeah. it, it, or be a, a physical presence in the middle. And and that's what's yeah. killed his career. I think. Well, here's the thing. I, I you know when I see a big guy like Kenny Cooper, I want to see a guy either. Well, I want to see a guy like Emil Heskey. Yeah. I want to see a guy can push through players and, and either make something out of nothing or get the ball to a smaller player that can just squeeze it by the goalie, you know? Mm-hmm. But he never was that. He was like a sort of a target player that really didn't amount to much. Yeah. He, it was like he was stuck between – he was like a small man in a big man's body when it comes to soccer. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, he never, he never really excelled at as, as a target striker of any form. Right. You know, he, he, was, he was more of the, the whole – Attempt at finesse, the, the touches, the, the beat a man on a dribble, but what he lacked there was speed. Right. He, could, he could beat the man on the dribble, but then the man would catch up. Right. So, uh, yeah, it, it, he has the body, he has the look of a target striker, but he just does not have the mentality of a target striker at all. Exactly. Yeah. All right, well, let's move on to the <clears throat> the bigger topic in, in many ways of the day, which is um, Etienne Barbara. Um, uh, came he? I guess he's from Malta. He's been playing in the NASL last year. He was the NASL Player of the Year, as far as I know, uh, playing for the Railhawks last season. So here's the deal: um, Montreal puts what's called discovery rights on this kid, and um, who scored 20 goals. He had nine assists last season. It's it's you know that's good for NASL. So he's a great candidate for moving up to play in MLS. Well, he's criticizing Montreal and MLS at this point because he's pissed off because because of the discovery rights system. He doesn't have any there's he has no opportunity to negotiate with any other team but Montreal. And what he's saying is Montreal is offering me the same salary I was getting with the Carolina Railhawks and that's basically just enough to put food on the plate and 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 go out and play soccer on an everyday basis. So, uh, I mean, guys, at what point does this whole discovery rights system uh, have to stop? Because it just doesn't seem to make much sense. A guy like that should be able to uh, go out, I think, and and negotiate with other teams. Simon, what do you think? Okay, um, you know, here's what I'm thinking. I don't understand how this guy suddenly became the poster boy for for, um, for being a great player that gets paid next to nothing. His 
Yes, and at you know at the NASL level, and don't even get me started on that level. He was good, fifty-four appearances, and I think like thirty goals. But going back when he was playing in Europe, he he wasn't that great, in my opinion. No. So for him to sort of complain about I'm not getting paid enough, guess what? You know what? Go be a banker or something. You don't have to play football. Get out. You know, do whatever. You want. So I really think that this this is the wrong guy to be the poster child for this. If it was a 21-year-old player with an absolutely wonderful future ahead of him and uh, a sort of a degree of brilliant clubs behind him, I would say, yeah, the guy has a point. But the guy's 30 years old. He's not, you know, he's not a spring chicken, and he's complaining about getting paid. How many 30-year-olds right now are getting paid? You know, Amer- in America, are getting paid massive amounts of money to play soccer. That 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 club is very limited. Mm-hmm. You know, yes, there's the there's the whole discovery player thing needs to be changed yeah because i read upon i read it and i'm like i don't understand it <laughs> like, i don't i don't get it yeah. you know, i think the whole the american system of soccer needs to be changed not just the discovery but this is the wrong guy to sort of hold up and go yeah if this guy can't put food on his table then what is it for us no this guy is a maltese you know soccer player with you know <laughs> that you know not even malta wants to put him back on the squad because he's so uh you know he's so negative i, I don't i don't think uh, this this is good for anyone's cause of getting rid of uh, uh, the discovery section of MLS. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, it's it seems like it's a rule that's just simply become obsolete. I can understand why they implemented it at the very beginning of the uh, the league itself. You know, it's a new league. It's fresh. You have markets in Columbus and Kansas City, but then you also have in New York and L.A. When it comes to a team like Columbus going out and uh, scouting a player, taking the time and the effort and the money to scout a player – uh, he comes to MLS, signs a contract, but then goes to L.A. because L.A. is willing to double his pay. At the beginning of the league, I can understand the reason behind it. You know, teams are given six uh, six discovery claims to make per season, ten if you're an expansion team. However, at this point, MLS is uh, well enough known uh, that we could just drop this. I mean, if Columbus were – if Montreal went out and tried to pick up this guy – he didn't like the offer, but then L.A. came back and offered him a bigger offer. Well, guess what? Montreal can go out and find another guy at this point. Not, and it's not that big of a dif- it's not that big of a problem. Exactly what Brett said. Yeah, That's well put. <laughs> Absolutely well put. Well, this yeah. this might be a shorter segment than I imagined, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all right. All right, we're, we're saying he's kind of a pain in the ass. He's kind of got a negative attitude. But the guy, listen, there were other players uh, who played second division soccer who have turned into pretty good guys. Uh, Sebastian Latou, I think, comes to mind uh, right Lonzo. away. Well, yeah, I mean, there have been guys who played in the second division. It wasn't right. always called NASL, but uh, obviously it was USL back then, who, uh, you know, can easily make that next step back up. And don't we want to make it easier for the stars of the second division um, to negotiate some sort of contract with um, whatever team of their pleasing um, at the higher level. I mean, doesn't that just kind of make sense in this whole discovery? I mean, if he sucked, nobody would have put a discovery rights thing on him in the first place, right? Right. True. So, uh, you know, obviously he's a good player. Um, the question is whether or not this system is fair, uh, whether or not it makes any sense that you can – tell a guy well yeah we want you to move up a whole division but guess what we're going to keep paying you the same thing you made when you played for a second division team it's just a matter of fairness to me to be to be honest with you there's people in the world that will that will get paid whatever they need to get paid to play soccer doesn't matter if it's at the you know at the Bernabeu or at the home depot center whether you pay them 30,000 or 50,000 they're just happy to play this guy doesn't sound like he's happy to play mm-hmm anywhere unless he's getting paid a ton of money that's great I, you deserve to get everyone deserves to get paid as much money as possible for whatever they're doing in life but at the end of the day these are the rules we're going to live by and honestly i don't think that it's there isn't and i'll be very sort of weird when i say this i don't think the level of playing for the carolina Railhawks is that much lower than playing for any Canadian club in, uh, in Major League <laughs> Soccer. I still think you're sort of at that same level. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So to complain like, well, I'm, I'm at a higher level. Yeah, if you went to, to New York or if you went to the Galaxy or if you went to Seattle, I would say, yeah, you're playing at a much higher level. You know, the club mm-hmm. itself. I don't think of it as the league as the high level. What well, about the club itself? You're not getting that. You're not, you're not moving up so much in the world that you deserve a gigantic raise. So... 
if he was going to the galaxy, I'd say shame on the galaxy. If he's going to, you know, wherever to to Montreal, uh, I would be like, yeah, take it. You yeah, know? and then maybe next year go somewhere else. You know, or quite yeah. Frank, quite frankly, I think the uh, the money issue itself is the problem with his argument because he is making a step up from a lower division. Where yes, he did excel down there, but would he excel up in MLS? I don't know. When you have players like with uh, Lorenzo Wentz, when he was with uh, New England, he was making thirty-two thousand a year, and he was starting and making it to the finals multiple years before he went to uh, Colorado. Yeah, you know, you have players like uh, Jaleel Anibaba for Chicago, who started every single game, but I'm pretty sure he's making the base pay at forty thousand. But then I think his compensated something like seventy thousand. But still, you have players who are contr- contributing at this high level that aren't making big bucks, right? And you don't hear them complaining. Well, it's it's gotten to the point. Uh, Brett and Simon, that even the English press, when they brought up the whole Tim Ream, Ream situation, regardless of what you think of Tim Ream, they were just saying, you know, this guy is making like, you know, this small pittance of, of pay. This is going to be a huge step up for them. It was almost like they were calling out MLS and saying, you know, it's kind of ridiculous how how little these guys are making yeah. on a day-to-day but basis. But go ahead. Like I think India is starting up its own I-League where it's more like the, the cricket they've set up to where Robbie Fowler might be making $7 million in a month. <laughs> you know, so it's all relative. Where, really, huh? <laughs> you know? So, well, you know. <laughs> he can sniff plenty of lines with that kind of money, huh? Uh, yeah, you can combine, come back to America and buy yourself two squads, you know? <laughs> Well, Robbie Fowler was one of always those guys. You always wonder, well, why didn't he uh, end up in MLS? And then he went to Australia, and you kind of figured yeah. out why he didn't end up in MLS. It was just kind of, I think we're getting better at figuring out who really still wants to play. Exactly. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we are out of time. And, uh, Simon, again, I want to thank you for coming on the show. We're going to have to have you back. Uh, My pleasure. Visit Simon Allen at Worldwide Soccer at Simon Allen Soccer. Dot com, And uh, until next time, uh, thanks to everybody for listening. Good night.